You know, today we're in uh, John chapter 19, so if you have your Bibles with you, uh, um, uh, if you can open them to John chapter 19. It's interesting um, on John chapter 19 is because this is typically a, a scripture that you would use for Good Friday service. But um, trying to be faithful to the process of going through the book of John, it just happens that Easter is falling in June. Now, um, I did read this book one time about that every Sunday should be Easter because we should be celebrating that Jesus died on the cross for us and was resurrected again. So I don't know that we really are that far off by having an Easter-type service or at least an Easter-type message today. But John chapter 19 is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It is why we are Christians. It is why that we have something to say to other people, not only because of John chapter 19, but also because of John chapter 20, which is the resurrection. But this moment in history gives us as Christians something to talk about. And, you know, what we've tried to do in the book of John is to get a better understanding of who Jesus is. And I don't know that you could understand Jesus any better than you under, if you understand John chapter 19. You know, like in John chapter 1, we say that he is the creator reaching to his creation in love. You know, two, he's our everyday God. Three, we, we can become born again through him. Four, he's our reset button. And five, he's enough. In 6 and 7, he satisfies our hungers and thirst. In 8, he becomes our liberator. In 9, he cures our blindness. In 10, he beats darkness. In 11, he becomes our salvation. He becomes our high priest. He becomes, as we spoke the last time we spoke in John, he is our king. And we come to this moment in, in chapter 19. We come to the moment when he is willing, as we preached in, on Easter, he is willing to die for you and I. To go through this process of the suffering and everything that goes with the crucifixion. But for today, I thought what would be interesting is that there is this symmetry, this parallelism between the beginning of Christ's ministry and this moment on the cross. It's almost as if God has allowed us to see in the beginning of his ministry what Jesus is trying to do, and at the end of his ministry, he fulfills it. And so in John chapter 19, we begin in verse 28. If you can turn your Bibles to John 19, 28 to 30. And it really encourages your pastor when he sees so many Bibles opened up and people reading them. Do you have John chapter 19, 28 to 30? Do you got it? Let me know you got it. All right. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we are awestruck by, why, by, by, by what you have done. That you were so willing to come, but you were so willing to put yourself as a spectacle upon this cross for us. Lord, may we learn from your words today, your message through history, that you loved us 
that you were willing to come and die for us so that we could be reconciled to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if, you, if you're going to um, follow me in your Bible, you'll need to also stick a finger in John 19 and also a finger in Luke chapter 4. So if you could have, if you're wanting to follow, we're going to sort of bounce back and forth between Luke and John. And um, when I was studying this week in John, and this is the first time I've ever seen this, I saw a parallel, a symmetry to when Jesus is tempted by Satan. And so I started to uh, study that, and I started to notice that there were these, the, the, the symmetry around that. And so we're going to start in Luke chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Luke chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And in this, we must remember, and I think it's important for all of us to understand this, that the beginning of chapter 4 is when Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist. God the Father has said to him, this is my son, I am so proud of him. And then Jesus gets forced into the desert. It says driven into the desert by the Holy Spirit. He's there for 40 days in this desolation, this desert where food and water are scarce, if not at all. He's thirsty. He's hungry. He's been there 40 days. He's exhausted. And then the devil comes. You know, I think often as Christians, especially new Christians, it's one of the things we have to always be careful with, is that we must understand that after salvation, there can be a period of time that we walk through this desert. Jesus does it. The Israelites do it. There seems to be an indication, Paul does it, that we walk through this desert, and Jesus is in this desert for 40 days. Hunger, thirst, and all the things that would go with being in a desolated place. And then the devil comes. And what does the devil say? And the devil said to him, Luke 4, 3 to 4, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. You see, the devil is attacking him where he's vulnerable at, right? And when you are vulnerable, that's where Satan's always looking to be. If he can find that weak spot, that's where he's going to attack at. You know, it's, it's not this church's responsibility to judge you, but it is our responsibility to help you see those weaknesses so that you will not be susceptible to being attacked. You see, the devil knew what was going on in the human body of Jesus. This also proves something that some people struggle with, that Jesus was 100% man. There are some religions out there that believe Jesus was only 100% God. But for him to hunger to the point where it was an issue, which it caused weakness, he had to have our human traits. Now, you can tell I haven't went 40 days without eating, right? Uh, many of you, I think, are probably have not went 40 days without eating ever. I think my best ever was probably three days. I think I fasted for three days one time on purpose. Um... I think that's probably the longest I've ever went. But 40 days is a long time, right? Uh, 40 days for most humans is the point where your body starts to shut down. That without nourishment, you start to really struggle. So Jesus was weak, and the devil says, Hey, well, if you're the Son of God, 
Just make this stone here into something you can eat. Surely you can do that. Can't God do anything? Right? God can do anything, so why can't why don't you do this? But Jesus says, It is written. And and I will tell you, when you're struggling in temptation, always remember that it is written is your first response. Go back to the Word of God. Have it in your hand and say, look, I'm going to read and understand what is going on, and from it I will be able to say it is written. If the Scripture is on your lips as it was on Jesus' lips, you can say it is written. So in the first temptation of Luke, in that first temptation, we see that the devil is attacking this hunger, this desire, this human fleshly need. And then if we go to John chapter 19, 28, and again we're going to be flipping back and forth. John 19, 28, and we read this earlier, Jesus cries out, I thirst. On this cross, Jesus again is vulnerable. Physically vulnerable. His body is, is being destroyed. If we believe even a third of what the Mel Gibson movie, the Passion movie is, it's not hard to believe that Jesus dies quickly because his body is being tortured and destroyed. The pain was unbearable. He thirsts to the point where he cries out, and so this fleshly desire is on display again. It's on display again. And I think we must understand this, is that in the beginning of his ministry, he is tempted of this fleshly desire. And then at the end of his ministry, again, he is tempted with this need, this hunger, this thirst. And I think one thing we must always remember is that when we are in this earth, that Jesus was tempted like we were tempted. That he was tempted on the cross. What is the temptation? It's the same temptation, right? As it was in the beginning, it is at the end. If you're God... Why don't you just satisfy your thirst? He could have said, I ain't doing this. I'm getting off this cross. I'm going to go get me a cheeseburger and a, and a Diet Coke somewhere. But no, he does not take that temptation. He does not try to fulfill that fleshly desire. And I think he helps us understand this, that God, Jesus, is saying that you must begin and finish the same way. You must believe in the beginning, and then your actions must show to the end that you love God, that your fleshly desires are not more important than God's plan. You see, I think what, what Jesus is demonstrating in this three-year ministry is he, he's teaching us that yes, yes, you know, there are going to be times you're tempted with these fleshly needs, these fleshly desires. And, you know, those can come from as anything as just being hungry or thirsty. It could go all the way through to drug addiction, sexual addiction. It could be all those things in between there. And you're going to be tempted by them, and you must trust me to be able to take care of them. And he demonstrates through all those three years how to live your life, how to do things, what the way is you should, you should live your life. And then he turns around at the end and stamps it. It is finished. I have started and I have finished the same way. The greatest 
compliment you could give a Christian is, is that you finish well. It's not just beginning well, it is finishing well. And so we see in this first temptation, not only was he tempted in the beginning, he was tempted at the cross. Secondly, secondly, we go back to Luke, Luke chapter 4, 6 to 8. It's interesting that the devil takes him up high so he can see. And then he says, and the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me. I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. The second temptation is a temptation of power. A temptation that that you could have authority over things. And I think often, when I think through some of the things that I have done in the past, some of the things that I'm not proud of, and perhaps you could think of those same type of things in your life, how often is it you allowing your ego to write a check that you can't cash? How often is it that you are trying to prove that you have this greater authority than somebody else? How often is it that you are seeking some type of power, whether it's over your spouse, whether it's over your family, whether it's over your church, whether it's over your community, whether it's over your country, And you're seeking the power instead of allowing Christ to be over each of those. Jesus realized that Satan ruled the earth in some ways, but he had no ability to confer power. That was given to God and Jesus as we read the last time in John 18. So when we see the temptation of ego... We see in it the humbleness of Jesus Christ. Now let's look when he's on the cross. Similarly in John 19, 19. Jesus is raised up on a cross. He's up on the side of this mount. This skull-like rock formation. And what does he see? He sees all of Jerusalem laying out before him. He sees, basically, in some ways, the world of Israel, because that's what Jerusalem was to them, laid out before him. And Pilate, it says in 19, Now Pilate wrote a title, put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. All at once, Pilate is conferring who has authority. The Jews actually argue with him. Well, he he said he was the king, but he's not our king. But Pilate decides that he is going to confer that Jesus has authority. But yet again, Jesus said, I do not have authority. I am not the king of this world. I'm the king of my kingdom. And when we start to think through what that means, so in the original temptation, the authority was tried to be given by the devil. At the cross, the authority has been given by a principality. But what interests me most about that is Jesus could have said, yeah, I'll take that authority. But he didn't. And as he looks over Jerusalem, I wonder almost if the devil was whispering in his ear, you're willing to die for them? Are you willing to die for these people 
that had just said, crucify him, have, 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 was so upset about it that they screamed and screamed, crucify him, crucify him. You almost can hear Satan saying, why would you die for them? Why would you be willing to give your life for them? You know, Satan's getting a pretty good idea there's something going on here. Because he, I don't think that he understands that he is being defeated in this moment. This is the defeat of Satan. But Jesus says, my only authority is in heaven. And I came to do one thing. And I ask you, when we start to think about this in our own context, And, and I only will use myself because I don't like to use other people. But you can place yourself there if you like. Was there not times in my life that I said crucify him? That my actions were saying crucify him. That my actions were saying I really don't care that he went to the cross. My actions were saying why would I even worry myself with the fact that he was willing to die for me? Why would I place him in any type of authority? My actions were saying, I really don't care. It makes me feel uncomfortable that my actions ever spoke that way. You know, we talk about how actions can speak good things about things. Like when we're walking in Christ, we can demonstrate those things. Those, that love for other people, the love for God, you know, that walking around in Christ, we should be the greatest neighbors of those around us. There should be a joy in people's life because Christians are in their life, because Christ is in their life. But we, okay, I, I won't use we, Probably you guys have never felt this way. We were just as bad at crucifying Christ as any person that was there physically. It's upsetting to think that to me. Until you recognize that his authority is such that you must be willing to die to your ego, to your selfishness. That until we're willing to do that, we were screaming, crucify him. Crucify him. But Jesus finished well in that he did not change what his mission was. Finally, in Luke chapter 4, verse 9 to 12, we read, Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to, to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down here, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said, It has been said, You ha shall not tempt the Lord God. The devil is saying, you are God. You do not have to die. You could call down legions of angels with one word spoken. You could come off the cross. But Jesus was not interested in in that. In fact, when we read in John 19, 10 to 11, then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, I want you to hear these words clearly. You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you 
from above. The recognition is, is that Pilate does not have control over Jesus' death. One of the things that we have struggled in the history of this world is, who's at fault for Jesus being crucified? And some will, and, and where that some of the anti-Semitic type of um, arguments come from is that they blame the Jews for that. Some will blame the Romans for that. I have suggested many times perhaps we should blame each other for that. But if Jesus did not want this to happen, it wouldn't have happened. If God's plan was not for him to be on this cross, to be crucified, it would not happen. You see, do not put anything more into power on this earth than to know this, that God rules over everything. God is sovereign over everything. Jesus is chose to die. It is something that should be earth-shattering to your faith. It should be something that drives you in your faith. It's not just that Jesus died on the cross, but He chose to die. It's not that He said, well, I'm going to let them take it, take it. He walked boldly into it. Peter cuts the ear off of, of a guy that's trying to get Jesus. Jesus puts his ear back on and says, it's time. It's time. And through this whole three years of ministry, from these temptations to the cross, over and over again, he says, I only have one purpose. In fact, what he says to his mother is, hey, it ain't my time yet. I ain't doing that. And he does it anyway, of course. But what he, is, what he is saying is, from the very beginning, he is myopic. He knows what his end result is. He's going to teach us along the way, but he knows he must die on the cross, that he must shed his blood, because without his blood being shed, we can never defeat these temptations. Here's what's interesting to me about the temptations. Here's what I want to make sure you understand. These are not particular to Jesus. The devil didn't go, boy, I'm just going to come up with some for Jesus because they need to be special because it's Jesus. Right? That's not what he does. He takes the most common problems that we have. In fact, you probably, if you just broke those three out and then took all the subgroups of those three, it's every sin that we will struggle with. And Jesus demonstrated in the desert how to defeat them. And then he finishes by defeating them. He defeats them by shedding his blood. You see, the only thing that was going to defeat sin is that there had to be this sacrifice, this blood sacrifice. It had to be the ultimate one because goats and sheep and and, and birds and all these other things weren't enough. It wasn't enough to solve the solution that needed to be done for the sin that we have inside of us. You know, many of us have tried over and over again to live a good life. And what we have proven is over and over again, we're not good enough. I would suggest to you that try and try as we might, that none of us are good enough without Jesus Christ. And he understands that enough to go to the cross. He understands that enough not to fight what is going to happen. He must spill his blood and he understands that. He understands that he can't just give you rules, but he must give you the ability to live reconciled in fellowship with God. 
The cruelest thing God could have ever done was say, here's a bunch of rules, good luck. Because we would continue to fail and fail and fail trying to be good. And in, in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the greatest sermons, well, the greatest sermon ever spoke on this earth. Jesus over and over again demonstrates one thing. You think you're good because you haven't cheated on your wife. Yet, when you lust after a person walking down the street, it's the same as if you cheated on her. He goes over and over again taking different sins and says, look, if you think that you can stop from lying, But yet, there are things that we still deceive people with. Without Jesus Christ, the temptations are things that we cannot control completely. Jesus finishes well so that we can finish well. It's one thing to say, I love what Jesus said. Chrysler can even say, love thy neighbor as thyself in one of their commercials. Anybody could say, well, we should love people more. But how often after that comes out of their mouth, does hate come right behind it? How often do we try to prove that you should love everybody with hate? Without Jesus in the center of our lives, none of us, none of us, as Paul writes, are good enough. And this moment that we are talking about today, the moment that he submits himself to the cross, that he submits this blood sacrifice, the moment that he does that, and he does that for this reason, so that you have the ability to fight the temptation. Not only do you understand what's wrong, but then you are able to not do what is wrong. It is the greatest gift that God has given me. Because I struggled over and over and over again with trying to good, do good, make a mistake. Well, I'm not ever going to do that again. Try to do good again. Make the mistake. I'm not going to ever do that again. I know nobody else done that in their lifetime. You know, some of you guys got pretty good poker faces. so. But some of you, I think, understand what I'm talking about. I mean, the Old Testament alone uh, recognizes through the Israelites over and over again, they're up, they're down, they're up. God, you're the greatest God of all time. We worship you. We love you. Thank you for saving us from the Philistines. I think we'll go over and worship the Asher poles. Why don't we build an altar over here of a golden calf? Uh, why don't we fight so much among each other that we have to actually separate and have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom? Oh, we love you, God, because we're in trouble again. God knew that we alone would not be able to do things with just rules. But he sent his son to this earth to die and to have this blood sacrifice so that he could finish, finish well so you can finish well. 